in a very Black Lagoon fashion, I'll cut some of the usual fluff from my intro and get right to the chase. Especially today since we're looking at Ravi, one of the characters who takes the least crap from the least amount of people. Nicknamed Two Hands for her dual wielding style, she'd sooner kill someone for looking at her the wrong way than let them live to do it again. She's the most recognizable character with the most badass scenes, the most attitude, and the most action. Yet, deep down, Revy is actually kind of terrible at first. Rowanapur is a city full of horrible people, run by mafias with gunshot white noise, but in all of that, Revy stands out to me. Because under the cover of all she touts, power, money, and guns, there's something different from all the other corpses in the City of the Dead. Something much better, and also something much worse. At first, Revy is welcoming of everyone's favorite businessman turned master manipulator Rock, seeing his fiery passion spark up to save their lives. But this welcoming feeling doesn't last long, as the pair reach their first fight aboard the sunken Nazi submarine in episode 5. I'll keep the points I covered in my video about Rock a bit shorter here, so check out the card on screen if you're looking for a bit more on these first couple points. But it's here Rock shows some idealistic thinking, the very thing Revy despises, saying that the war medals she takes should be left there with these men, who had families and people who loved them as reminders of their accomplishments that they existed, not as Nazis, but as people. They would have an inherent value to them. Two Hands breaks things down for him in her style, saying those medals, like the skeletons the crew now are, only have one possible label, things. Simple objects that can be exchanged for money, that's the only value they have, a fixed price to be bought and sold. You use things to get money, which gets you more guns, which gets you more power, and you're sustained in that way. Keep up or die. That's not all she says, capping off their talk by telling Rock, You decide you're gonna tell me what's proper, you'll no longer be one of us. When that happens, I'm gonna kill you. She staunchly views his position as a hypocrite looking down on her and refuses to take more of it, ever. That is, until he stands up to her in episode 7. After closing an arms deal with the rip-off church that Revy would have failed alone, he doubles back to the point she said to never bring up again, stating how he has nothing to apologize for. All he did was state his mind. But if nothing else, she sticks to her word and fires a shot that Rock turns into a near miss and the ensuing screaming match gives us some of the most detail about the pair than in any other scene. Here, Rock becomes proof of something she never wanted proof of, and reminds her of everything she tries to forget. Not only did he just solve their deal without a gun, but he pushes her pistol away just enough to save his life, saying, See that? There are some problems you can't solve with a gun. And he's right. Going through all their errands for the day happy and peacefully while she's stewing in her own bad mood. He pushes further, professing hate for her cowardly clinging to guns and a tragic heroine persona in an effort to avoid anything meaningful. I think this is where he really starts to get to her. Before, she wanted to kill him because he challenged her. The new guy with no experience telling her what to do triggered a very revy reaction. Kill the problem. But once he hits this point, she doesn't try to shoot him again, despite having her second Beretta right there. She screams, throwing around tableware and even the tables themselves. This is less of a hardened gunman moment and more like a child's tantrum when they're caught in a lie. This is more evident as she tries to change the argument in her favor, saying, What do you know about my life, huh? What the hell do you know about me? Brock doesn't fall for the shift and hits back, saying how everyone lives and suffers alike, no matter what and she just doesn't want to understand that. It's safe to say he hits the nail on the head once more here as this is something she does multiple times, bringing up her past as a uniquely shit experience that determines her beliefs. And she did have a shit past, darkened even more by what we see in Roberta's blood trail. It's horrifying and she's understandably scared and angry because of it. But this reasoning of her past becomes an excuse for a lack of growth. She knows it and Rock knows it too. Instead of thinking about situations that challenge her, or changing her point of view, or debating if she made the right call, she throws up this excuse every time. No one is like me, and everything is shit, so no one understands, and there's no point of trying. In this way, she can stay stagnant forever. But she knows deep down that this is just her front. When Ra calls her out on these issues, it's the only time we see her act like this from simple words alone. 
screaming and near panicked, even admitting it's all I know how to do after Rock says it's better than feeling sorry for yourself, crying about your hard life. He's got her here, he nailed her reasoning and she doesn't know how to deal with it. Anything else and she would just shoot her way out, but no one has pinned her like this before, calling her out on her excuses and fronts. She's truly vulnerable for the first time in a long while and she can't deal with it. The only thing that stops the fight is Rock telling her, I'm not gonna stand by and let that happen, about how she's acting like the people who betrayed him. After that, she backs down, hides her face, and in a sense, lightens up a bit. This is another likely first for her. The first time someone's looked at her and even remotely said that they wanted to save her in some way. Someone willing to put in time and effort to try and help her be better. I think this is why the argument ends and she turns it into more of a joke fight saying he's a big idiot who won't live long and just a few minutes later, somewhat nervously asking him where he stands, which side he wants to be on. Let's listen to how she asks that. So, um, I just want to know which side you want to be on. I think that, um, that hesitation and nervousness is very important. That's not a very revy thing. But Rock takes his signature Twilight stance and that's good enough for her. Good enough for them to have the classic cigarette kiss. I don't think this has to be strictly romance based, although it's clear from her interactions with Edda there's something there. But if all she wanted was what Edda always suggests, or even just some regular relationship, Revy is the kind of person who would just go and take what she wants. The other person would know what's up near guaranteed. Here she doesn't do that, because what she's really looking for is an out. That's likely the source of this nervousness. He's no longer the annoying new guy, but a sign of hope. For the first time ever, the potential of an exit from the city of the dead, someone uncorrupted who could manage such a feat. Rock, as the man in the twilight, is that which she's always wanted. Now moving on, I don't think we need to spend too much time on the final arc of season 2, but it does provide some evidence of her new hope through a shift in how she treats Rock. When he goes to Japan to translate for Balalaika, Revy tags along as protection given they're dealing with heavy mafia affairs. But we know this wasn't fully an assignment and had some choice. On the phone with Rock, Benny says, You're quite the ladies man, you know she only went cause she was worried about you. That being said about the woman who was willing to kill him for a simple disagreement within a year ago means a lot more than it may seem. She's also consistently softer with Rock than everyone else, and especially on this trip. At the local festival mid-gun game, she stops to ask a spaced out Rock smiling if he's remembering something, going on to say he should visit his family or whoever he has left there. Getting into those kinds of topics seems very not revy, and maybe because she wants to know what it's like to live outside the darkness, to have a normal family, a normal home. And making Rock face these things again may awaken a bit of the old in him, more of a potential for him to exit the darkness, maybe even with someone else in tow. She's not all optimism about it though. When they do go to his house, she waits in the nearby park and thinks to herself, I'll be waiting here for you, but not forever. Just until I finish drinking this. After that, I'm leaving. Coupled with that somber look as he walks away, likely worried at what may happen that he'll leave her alone and send her back to Moranapur with a now broken dream. There's also the factor of change still. To say she's scared of living another life would probably be an understatement given her lifelong reliance on money, guns, and power. She's a cold-blooded killer who loves the thrill of a hunt. With her devilish smile as she guns down foes, there's more reason for her to be resistant to change along with all of the habits we discussed. A normal life means facing some of those fears, dropping the persona and becoming someone new, something she's resisted for her whole life. Even if she wants to start it now, it wouldn't be easy, so she says, Your home is a good place. I guess that's why I got a little lost. But it's so far away, I could never reach it. For a second there, I think I even forgot that I don't know how to live anywhere else. Recognizing for the first time the real differences between them and trying to push him away because that's what she knows how to do. But he doesn't leave her there, he leaves his past. She causes a scene with her guns and closes off his path home at his request. And after that she smiles for the first time in a while, that 
signature smile after looking the most melancholy ever, breaking the somber possibility that her dream was dead and buying her time to face the changes she fears so much. And now we get to Roberta's blood trail and some more of the super rock heavy character heavy scenes that make them some of the best in all of anime. First, I want to jump forward to the final two episodes of the OVA, where Revy and Fabiola have a one-on-one -on -one chat. The younger of the pair leads off with a fair point about Rock. Why haven't you toughened him up already? This is strikingly poignant given that's a very Revy thing to do and something she tried early on but never continued. She's obsessed with power and hates who she considers to be weak people. Rock is very much like one of those people, yet all she does is say he belongs on a beach with a cold drink, a courtesy she never extends to others. Fabiola correctly deduces why she hasn't toughened him up, for the hope of a dream that's left. To pull Rock into the darkness and toughen him up means that that hope would be lost. No more chance to leave the city of the dead alive. Plus, fitting in line with her stagnation, that potential or idea is sometimes more important than reality or it ever happening. Even though Rock left his old life behind right in front of her, if she still believes him to be in the twilight, then she can still believe that she may be one day as well. And that static idea, like the guns and money she clings to, is more important than reality. So she puts up the beach rock front as if he's a light man stuck in the dark. Q, but if those things are important to you, then maybe you two should go to South America and open a little vegetable stall. But you two are never going to do that. It's clear to her that Revy doesn't want to recognize Rock for who he is and ignores the evidence that he's turning mad, saying instead that he's just swept up in things, in over his head. She's dropped her front and placed it between her and Rock instead. To her, he's simply someone else, a frozen image of who he used to be, the new guy. And Revy is just a skeleton from the land of the dead. And the dead can't change, they already met their fate. Now they just wait. In this argument, she resorts back to the same exact thing she said and did in episode 7. She can't change because she's already dead, and the one left standing has the most power, and all the things Rock threw in her face is false, she touts once again. And there's more to this scene than just that. She hates Fabiola for the same reason she hated Rock then. The little maid is the proof that she didn't want. She's proof that Rock is going off the rails and everyone can see it. She's proof that someone from a shitty place can still stay out of the darkness, hence her resorting to saying that she's from the city of the dead now. She's forcing her to see the lack of change once more, forcing her to see what she really wants, that dying dream, and forcing her to see someone who denies power and guns being happy with a kid who's pretty damn similar to Old Rock in Garcia. It's understandable why she hates her so much and why she's so upset right after their conversation. She's doing what Fabiola said. You should check your reflection next time you sneer at someone. Now we can jump back to see why she's so upset even more. To one of the best scenes in Black Lagoon, Blood Trail Episode 2's bullet type scene. There's even more than that in there as well, but that's getting saved for some more rock talk later. Rock says, All my life I've been waiting for the gunpowder to go off. You know what you need to ignite gunpowder? You need a gun. This leads Revy to debate what kind of bullet rock is, eventually settling on one, a silver bullet. A mythical, expensive, and mostly useless hunk of metal that when used at the right time and on the right enemy, saves your life. Specifically on a monster, one that's about to eat you, she says. And this isn't just Revy being colorful with her words, there's some near literal stuff in here. Like Rock says, she's the gun. He's her silver bullet. The monster she has to kill is her life in Roanapur, the darkness. The right time is passing her by as her human ammo is slowly slipping into the same life as her, and she's only got one shot. Fuck it up and she's eaten forever, her favorite saying, a corpse in the city of the dead. And this is doubled down on when she sends him to get water, saying to herself, Damn it. It's not fair. Imagine watching the only person who you think could save you constantly fail at saving other people and never even trying it for you. Garcia the first time, the Romanian twins, Yukio, it's always a mess up and it's always someone but her. She's missing the chance because he doesn't even know the chance is there. That's why it's not fair to her. 
It's also backing to a little line later on, after Fabiola sneaks a swim in the pool while Garcia is asleep and gets extremely embarrassed when she's seen. Revy explains the maid's embarrassment, saying, She can't tell you she wants some time off because you're being a little prick about finding four eyes. It's not an exact translation to her situation, but she knows what that's like. To want some time away from the darkness with someone who's not even in it, but keeps pulling you back to it nonetheless. It's also fitting that it involves swimming, and she always refers to Rock as being on a beach. That's likely why she gives some applicable advice to someone she hates right here. This explains why she's so harsh on Garcia and the others Rock has tried to save before as well. It's a bit of jealousy, knowing Rock said he wouldn't give up on her, but spends all of his hobby time working on other people he knows much less. And she's always the one getting hurt by Rock's antics. A concussion against Roberta the first time around, a sword through the leg because he just had to go back and try to get Yukio, and now bullets in both her arms because of Rock's plan. She goes through a lot of shit for him, even pulling guns on big names like Balalaika, something no one wants to do. Hence why Benny's with Rock instead of her for part of Blood Trail. She even directly says, I'm getting real tired of helping him with this crap. I'm tired of his crap. It's been a long ride and it hasn't paid off yet. All she's gotten is more of the same. More false fronts to prevent change. More lying to herself about what she really wants, and more encounters with people who read her like a book. But getting back to the end of Roberta's blood trail, we can see fully why she was upset now and why she breaks out of it and gives Rock a damn good kick. I think in that moment in the ship, she finally made a choice to move forward, whether it was for better or for worse. It seems like she picks the path back to Rowanapur, leading off her decision with Fine, I get it. I know exactly what I am. And then asking Rock to leave once the mission was over. It's not about personas to hide wishes anymore. If it's not gonna happen, if the silver bullet is spent, then fuck it, she's gonna move on. Instead of hiding behind the things she claimed so vigorously before, now she can embrace them. She can't go to the light, but she can be her damn near best in the darkness. In her final line, she says, It's gonna hurt if you keep looking at that city with life in your eyes. Meaning she knows what it feels like to look at Roanapur with life in your eyes, and what it feels like once you stop. Her mind's made up, and this is who she is. In the same way she sees herself now, she also sees Rock for who he is. There's no need to keep tunnel-visioned and stagnant on her view, because who he is doesn't hold a bearing over her anymore. With that kick, she almost flips their roles and does a bit to save him, knocking him back to a bit more like who he was before. She says physically with the kick, get over yourself and snap out of it. He was mostly ignoring her words and being a manipulative asshole, so she put him in his place. You could say, toughened him up a bit. And I think that says all it needs to. Anyway, that's all I have to say on this one, but likely not all I have to say on Black Lagoon forever, because Roberta's Blood Trail does drop a lot of good points on us, and even a possible continuation of the rock video I made that exploded a little bit here on the channel. Uh, thank you again to everyone who has watched that video, especially if you're here now. Anyway, I should stop rambling about Black Lagoon and start rambling about the usual plugs at the end of the episodes. That's right, I'll have a link to my Discord in the description below if you want to reach me directly, talk anime with some other fans, or even potentially join in on some game nights I'm tossing around in there. Uh, you can also go ahead and like the video if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't, and leave me a comment you know, uh, letting me know what you thought about Black Lagoon, about Roberta's Blood Trail, about uh, the points I made here today, if I forgot anything, if you have anything to add, uh, because that is one of the best parts of doing this, is seeing what you all have to add to it as well, and there are times I miss things, so let me know down below. Also, more videos on screen right now if you want a little bit more like this, and I think that's all I have to ramble on about today. So anyway, I'll just let you get back on with your day. <laughs> this, uh, this is, for me, even a terrible intro. Anyway, I'll see you later. Hope to see you again soon. God damn it, I suck at outros.